bam, bam, several of Billy's men, who were close to the gate, had all mysteriously fallen down. Captain, I think there's a trap at the front lines, whispered one of Billy's men. Billy frowned and viewed the scene with his binoculars, which were hanging around his neck. He and some of his men were currently laying low in the bushes. Since he had to ensure the switch at the other perimeters, he couldn't join the battle yet. Until he was sure that the switch had been made successfully, he looked at the scene and nodded. Indeed, there was a trap laid out at the front lines. There were several thin ropes of wire stretched around the area. When the soldiers ran at full speed towards the gate, they were instantly tripped by these wires. And once they fell, those terrorists around them would shoot them dead. Captain, not good. Some of the men who tried to sneak towards the right wall were caught in net traps. Hum. Staying here any further would be risky for our mission. How many spies have successfully been added? Bully asked. Three at the back wall, one at the left wall, and none at the right wall. Hum. That's good enough. Sound the command for everyone to retreat. Immediately, one of his men got up and yelled. Retreat. Retreat. On the battlefield, everyone paused for a mini second and immediately ran back. Of course, as they escaped, a stream of bullets continued to rain on them. How could these terrorists let them go so easily? Never. Gee, gee. The good guys ran as fast as they could, while jumping around like grasshoppers, as they tried to dodge these bullets. Of course, those that were shot limped away in a sorry state. Some died, while others were brutally injured. As the night passed by, both sides were constantly battling and injuring each other. At some point, the terrorists had discovered the spies within their camp. And at another point, both Lucius and Landon had lost a considerable amount of men. Sunday was here, and there were only four hours left before the deadline approached. Lucius and his men were currently standing within Landon's estate. They had finally succeeded in getting in. With only four hours left, they decided to go all out. No matter what, they had to rescue those hostages. Lucius and his men were standing on one side while Landon and his own men were standing on the other side. We, the armed forces of Baymart, are here to arrest you for several charges against our home. Do you know your crime? Lucius yelled out. Oh, what crimes could I and my family possibly commit? Landon said. Don't play dumb. Where are the hostages? Lucius said. Hump, if you want them, you'd have to take them over my dead body. My thoughts exactly. Mark. Focus on Gary. Josh, focus on Trey. The rest of you, kill these terrorists and rescue the hostages. As for me, I tackle their leader. Lucius commanded. Landon looked at them and smiled. I was thinking the exact same thing. It seems that our minds really are alike. Instantly, everyone scattered about the estate. Gee, gee. Landon ran up to Lucius and fired several shots at him. Lucius immediately rolled on the ground and hid behind a pillar that was a little distance further from Landon. As Lucius was about to poke his head out from behind the pillar, Landon shot several bullets at its edges. Never would I have thought that I would fight you like this old man. Brat. Watch yourself. Who are you calling old? Instantly, Lucius ran away from the column and made several shots as he ran backwards. Gee, gee. Landon back flipped away as he continued to dodge the bullets. Hey old man, didn't you say that you wanted to know how painful these bullets are? Just stay still, and I'll show you. No need brat. I already shot my shoulder with one two days ago. There's no way that I'll allow myself to receive another shot again. As they fought, everyone within the estate was busy tearing themselves down. Guarding the hostages were Ruby, Gary's girlfriend, Yara, Trey's girlfriend, and twelve other soldiers. Footsteps slowly approached as they guarded their prisoners. Ava, Yara, and Ruby thought. Ava was Mark's girlfriend, so of course she would sign up to be in his camp. Ava came over with 14 soldiers. You all give up and return our hostages to us immediately. Another soldier said, No way, not without a fight. Yara said, That works even better, Ava said smilingly. Everyone immediately dispersed themselves. Ava had decided to attack Ruby since she was one of the strongest within the group. Gee, gee, everyone tried to shoot their targets. As Ava shot, 
Ruby front flipped in a zigzag manner, while ensuring that she moved towards Ava. Once she was close, she immediately fell on the floor in a split, and spinned her legs like fan blades in attempt to trip Ava. One would say that Ruby was as flexible as a gymnast. In fact, her fighting style was a mixture of Eddie Gordo, from Tekken, and Mystique, from the first X-Men series. Ava wasn't weak either. As she was about to fall, she immediately used her hat to do a handstand and swiftly landed back on her feet again. But of course, Ruby didn't even give her time to breathe at all. Bam! Ava had blocked Ruby's fist with her own fist and quickly grabbed onto Ruby's left hand. From there, she pulled Ruby towards her and used her left knee to hit Ruby's left side. Ruby blocked the attack by using her other hand to block Ava's knee. Gee, gee, everywhere within the estate, one would find people running around and shooting each other. And just like that, time was up. Only six out of ten hostages were rescued, and both leaders from each camp were still alive. It was concluded that both sides had lost. For Lucia's team, they lost because they couldn't even rescue all their hostages. And they didn't even manage to kill Landon. For Landon's team, they lost for exactly those same reasons. They lost their hostages and couldn't even kill the leader of the Baymard's army. But even though everyone lost, they were still feeling pumped and excited. Dude, I've learned my lesson. Never will I shoot such a shitty shot again. You're telling me. I fired seven bullets towards Van, but he managed to dodge all of them. By back flipped, front flipped, and even used some close combat moves to kick my gun away. At the beginning, that's how it was for me too. But as time went on, I could easily predict my enemy's next step. Sigh. We need more practice. Don't worry. His Majesty had said that we will have short two-hour sessions at least twice or thrice within each week. I got shot, and I swear that my heart almost stopped from the pain. Look, I'm still limping. Dude. If not of our head shields, I would have lost my head by now. Bottom line. I never want to be shot again, that's for sure. Yeah. Me too. Your Majesty. I'm afraid that I don't know where the young master is currently at. But I promise you that I'll definitely pass on your message when I see him. Said one of Santa's subordinates. December had come, and Landon had thought it wise to personally hand over the information about the underground businesses to Santa. With information like this, one needed to make sure that not too many people heard of it. Because if these people were threatened, one could never be sure if they prefer to spill the beans or choose to die with the information. Hence, to keep Santa's subordinates safe, it was best for them to remain unaware of the situation. Plus, he was afraid that if he passed on those letters, they might get lost or fall into the wrong hands on their way to Santa. All right, tell him I'll be waiting for his arrival. Once Santa's subordinates left, Landon focused on this month's task. Presently, he had already taken care of the learned slaves, children, caretakers, new teachers, nurses, new police officers, guards, soldiers, and so on. And right now, Landon was left with 5,870 workers. Speaking about population, Baymard currently had 57,422 people living within it. Landon had estimated that by July next year, Baymard would have definitely reached a population of 90,000 people, which would be enough for now. In truth, Baymard could host up to 9.5 million people if it wanted to. But the reason why Landon decided to stop buying slaves in July was simply due to the fact that Baymard would be open to the public within that month. And the simplest way for people to infiltrate the city would be to disguise themselves as slaves and refugees. To solve this problem, Landon had thought about various approaches. Firstly, only Santa would be in charge of sending slaves and refugees to him. Secondly, when these people were taken, all of them had to think that they were heading to Corona, Terry K, and so on. In other words, when Santa and his men buy these slaves, they would have to lie about their final destination. I'm these way, the slave traders and spies around several shipping docks wouldn't be bothered about sending their spies to them. After all, these spies wanted to head to Baymart, and not towards Terry K, Deiferous, or Corona. And when these slaves and refugees finally arrived, Landon wouldn't let any of them become citizens yet. They would have to spend several years in Baymard before getting their permanent residence card. And from there, they would have to spend extra years again before becoming a citizen. Of course, if they gave birth to children here, 
their children would be permanent residents, and not refugees like them. There was no slavery in Baymard, so all slaves would automatically become refugees. These refugees could work in all places around Baymard, except within the manufacturing industries and armed forces. In fact, Landon had come up with more than 20 ways to keep these spies in check. But of course, nothing was ever guaranteed in this life. He was sure that some of them would still find a way to wiggle around the system. But they would be in for the shock of their lives when they try to break entry into any industry or building within Baymart. There will be electric fences, heat sensor cameras, smoke bombs, alarm systems that would trigger an automatic lockdown within the building and so on. Even getting information from the citizens was going to be a pain in their butts. This was because everyone within Baymard knew about the punishment for releasing such information. The punishment was death. Landon didn't want to seem too harsh, but his life was also on the line here. The system would definitely deal with him if you went easy on these spies. Everyone knew better than to give up any info about Baymard. They were all paid well and had peace within Baymard. No one was willing to throw their lives away just like that. And even if they were given all that money, where would they go to? Please. They were already used to electricity and good living here. They were absolutely sure that there was no place like Baymart. So how could they leave all this luxury just to go out there and suffer? And to make matters worse, they could even be double-crossed and killed by the people that offered them the money. Many of them had been slaves, so they knew how the world worked. For all they knew, their actions could lead them right back into slavery later on. Also, some of them came here with their families and had also made new friends here as well. So how could they help the enemy to kill and conquer Baymart? Even the little children in school were taught about the consequences of releasing anything about Baymart, as well as the dangers about releasing their family situation to strangers. Although the children weren't told any classified information in school, they still had to learn about keeping their mouths shut. There was no reason why they should tell strangers about how much their parents make, where money is usually kept in their homes or even what their parents do in Baymart. One should always be wary of strangers. That's why Landon had read out multiple stories about such matters and the consequences for such actions. He had also made sure that they knew what would happen if they followed strangers there and there. Also, the people have also been briefed and taught about the role of police officers and guards within the city. They had been told about the importance of reporting anything suspicious to these officers. All in all, Landon was sure that by the time the city welcomed visitors in July, Baymard would be ready for attacks from spies and other armies. Anyway, with 5,870 workers, Landon sent 500 to the alchemy industry, 500 to the food industry, 500 to the textile industry, 370 to the cleaning industry, 1,000 to the construction industry, 3,000 to all construction sites within Baymard. Your Majesty, at the start of October you requested for the pharmaceutical industry and the waste and recycle management industry to be built. And last month, you requested for the new printing industry to be constructed as well. In a few days' time, the printing industry and the pharmaceutical industry would be fully constructed. And by next week, the other ones should be completed as well. So what do we do about the workers? Well, Landon had already known that these industries would be completed within this December. So he had already come up with several designs for other industries. Tim, have those who focused on building the pharmaceutical industry split them into two groups. One group will immediately construct a boat and ship manufacturing industry, while the other will build a car manufacturing industry. As for those who focused on the waste and recycle industry, have them build a weapon manufacturing industry instead. And finally, those who focused on the printing industry should start building Baymard's new bank ASAP. As for the new construction workers, send them to aid those constructing the roads, homes, shopping mall, city wall, and all other construction sites around Baymart. Fishing and military boats and ships. These were Landon's main reasons for building this industry. Ships were usually built indoors with the help of indoor cranes and other heavy electrically powered machines. Anyone who had ever visited a boat PR ship building industry back on Earth would know how much work went into building these ships and boats. A one or two deck level fishing boat could be built within a month or two, based on the size of the boat and how many people or machines were working on these boats at once. But for proper military ships, 
five or six months would be enough to construct them, and sometimes they could even take up to ten months to build, depending on their size. For merchant ships, those ones would probably need three to four months to build. And for cruise ships, these ones could take seven months to several years to build. Again, depending on their sizes. For now, Landon didn't want to focus on super massive ships that would take years to build. Landon wanted ships that could be built in a matter of months. All in all, Baymard needed ships and boats. And it will take two and a half months to build the actual ship industry itself. Hence Landon wanted to use this winter time to construct as many ships as he could possibly make. Of course a car industry was needed as well, so that all car parts could be installed mechanically. This would drastically cut down the time used for the workers to build several cars and heavy machines, as well as improve productivity and work efficiency. This industry would probably take about four to five months to construct as well, so it was best to get it done now. A weapon manufacturing industry was definitely a must as well. This one would take three and a half months to complete, and by then, Landon would make missiles, grenades, and so on. And finally, based on the bank's massive size that Landon had depicted, it had to be built now, since it would take about four to five months to complete. Plus, it was always important for money to be stored properly. This was Baymard's safe period. No one knew of the development within the city, and everyone was currently minding their own business right now. But after Baymard gets open to the public, everyone would stick their noses in the cuts business. Hence it was better to take advantage of this piece and build everything that they needed ASAP. With the construction workers out of the way, Landon could now focus on new goods for the month. Your Majesty, so these watches and alarm clocks would be able to tell the time? Hump, they will. Tim was really mind-blown by the fact that such a thing could even exist. Sometimes, he felt like Landon wasn't human. No, no. Scratch that. Most of the time, he felt like Landon was a god in human skin. The more he read the notebook in his hand, the more fidgety he became. Your Majesty, will we sell these goods out of Baymart in future? Yes. These ones will be sold out, since they work on batteries. The concept of batteries wasn't new to Tim and a lot of workers within his industry. The only battery that existed in Baymard right now was the one for heavy machines. These ones consisted of sulfuric acid solution and several flat plates that acted as galvanic cells in series. Granted, when they made their first battery ever, it wasn't as well done as those ones back on Earth, but it still got the job done either way. The only problem was that those ones didn't last as long as those ones back on Earth. When they made their first battery, its outer box was made of metal, and some of the plates were done unevenly. But once better tools and plastic came into the picture, Landon switched it up and modified several outer components once again. All in all, these batteries were constantly improved upon monthly. For wristwatches, tiny coin, or button, size batteries were ideal for them. And for wall clocks and alarm clocks, the batteries needed to be like the ordinary batteries made back on Earth. Landon was talking about the A, AA, and AAA battery types and so on. To make batteries, one needed special materials and chemicals that would aid in the transfer of electricity. There needed to be a cathode, anode, and a fluid or material that would aid in electrical flow. Landon was sure that the people outside Baymard wouldn't be able to come up with the exact components and chemical solutions required for battery production without guidance. So why should he be worried? Even if they made the other components of the watches and put them together, the watch's hands wouldn't tick without a battery. Take, for example, lithium batteries. He had already planned on extracting lithium from lithium feldspar rocks underground the caves and use them to make ordinary batteries as well as coin batteries. Lithium was the core drive within these types of batteries. And if people didn't know how to extract it from ores and rocks, how were they supposed to make these batteries? Plus, other places didn't have plastic or rubber to make the outer frames for wall clocks, as well as alarm clocks so there was essentially nothing for him to worry about. Once Baymart officially opened up to the public in July, these items would be exported to various regions around Hertfilia. And your majesty, this photocopying machine is supposed to lessen the burden within the printing industry? If it does what you say it can do, then the workers would probably celebrate in your honor. Was it that bad? Your majesty, you have no idea. We have a massive waitlist from all the workplaces already. Well. Landon could understand their joy as well. To put it simply, 
when any workplace needed to make copies of any document, they would immediately place orders with the printing. Do that their copies could made. This industry handled school papers, reports, books, I.D cards, driving licenses, and other important documents around Baymart. So if the hospital needed 20 copies of a particular document, the workers within the printing department would have to get it done for them. Of course, the hospital would have to pay for these services as well. And all these printing orders had put everyone around Baymart on a waiting list, which greatly slowed down development and productivity. Hence, Landon had wanted to make photocopying machines ASAP. Firstly, all industry and workplace documents should be photocopied within those particular workplaces. For security reasons, it wasn't proper to have confidential documents leave those workplaces. And secondly, this would greatly improve productivity and efficiency around Baymart. Everyone wouldn't need to run up and down the place, as they could just make several copies of multiple documents within their offices or workplaces. And the printing press could finally focus on their numerous jobs, like printing books, I.D cards, labels on several company boxes, plastic bags, clothes, and so on. Plus, having a photocopying machine will also be good for the landport and banks in future. Any visitor or customer's document that needed several copies could be done within those establishments, rather than running back and forth and keeping these people waiting. Now, focusing on the machines themselves, the interior part consisted of five main components within them. A light bulb, a photosensitive drum, two rollers, a toner, and a conveyor belt for loading the paper. Baymart already had conveyor belts as they were previously manufactured at the start of October. And of course, light bulbs and rollers already existed as well. So that just left Landon with the toner and the photosensitive drums to make, which weren't hard to do. Anyway, the machine worked like so. When one places his, her document upside down and presses the start key, an intense beam of light from the bulb flashes onto the document. This light then gets reflected towards the photosensitive drum. Now here's where the magic really happens. This drum is electrostatically charged by a high-voltage wire, as well as coated with a photosensitive chemical, selenium, since selenium is a semiconductor. That would mean that it would act as an insulator in dark areas, as well as conduct electricity when light falls on it. Bottom line, when the light gets reflected off the document, it reaches the photoconductive drum and gets its ions displaced. As negative charges make an electrical shadow, the drum begins to rotate. And finally, this negatively charged shadow moves towards a positively charged toner. Negative and positive. You get the picture. Both charges stick to each other, and an inked image of that document is formed within the charges. Then a new sheet of paper is feed into the hopper of the photocopying machine. The hopper carries the paper on a conveyor belt upwards and moves towards the drum and the toner. The charges drop onto the new sheet of paper, and the document is finally photocopied. As the photocopied paper makes its way out of the machine, it will pass through two hot rollers. These rollers aid in fusing the toner particles onto the paper permanently by inserted heat and pressure onto it. The whole process involved light, reflection, conductivity, and ions. Well, anyway, this machine will have an on and off button on it and would work electrically and steam-powered for those within buildings that don't have electricity. A photocopying machine doesn't necessarily need the internet. It wasn't a printer. Also, Landon had decided to add several other buttons at the corners of the photocopying machine, kind of like a keypad. If they wanted to make 10 copies, they just had to tap one and zero keys, and then press start. Well, with this, he decided to start teaching the workers a little bit about computer engineering as well. Up next, Landon wanted to focus on radios. In any society, communication was key, be it within the military, schools, police forces, hospitals, and so on. Communication gadgets were a must within any developed city. When talking about radios, there were two major factors that come up, frequency and waves, especially sine waves. In the modern era, radio waves control everything. From the tunes played in cars, to the police radios used for alerting police officers, to the radios within planes. Radio's waves and frequencies could be seen everywhere. In fact, even cell phones, televisions, Morse codes, and walkie-talkies use these wave systems. Making radios aren't that hard to do. Back on Earth, some people in the wilderness could make them with spoons, wires, coins, and an energy source. Like batteries. 
Essentially, radios send out wave signals, which in turn involve frequency. Understanding the basic concept and laws of physics applied here was what was really important. Different radio channels had different frequencies. Hence Landon wanted the workers to properly understand these concepts now. Every modern radio had three main parts, the transmitter, the receiver, actual radio box, and the antennas that focus on radiating the signal all around various areas. Of course, there were several other components as well that'll be molded separately and attached to each other when putting the radio together. So in essence, Landon wanted the workers to start understanding these concepts now. As almost every communication gadget involved waves and frequency, he had also decided that from now up till April, he wouldn't create any new goods again, except for food, books, and medicine. Especially medicine. He needed to focus on this area so that he could quickly complete the system's mission. Hence, within this time period, construction will be his main focus. After all, the coastal region needed protection against enemy ships. And these peaceful times were the best times to improve Baymard's defenses. Don't worry, your majesty. We'll get it done immediately, Tim said. No, take your time. There's no major rush in producing these radios. I just need them to be done before March, Landon said. Although April was Landon's deadline, he gave the workers an early deadline, so that even if they're late on production, it wouldn't really affect his main plan for Baymart. Within this time frame, he would be teaching them about physics, so that they could better understand what they were doing. By May, he had hoped to start making walkie-talkies for the army, guards, and police officers, as well as house phones for all buildings. And these calculators were supposed to aid us in solving math? Tim was really confused. Was His Majesty trying to build a human being from metal? How can it do math for them? Usually, he would believe Landon. But this time, his heart wanted to believe it, but his mind kept saying that it wasn't logical. Trust me, Tim. It's possible. Anything is possible. Of course, the last thing that Landon wanted to focus on were calculators. They needed calculators in the banks, schools, and all other offices. Calculators were basically simple programmable computers. For the workers to better understand the theory, Landon had decided that from now, December, to April, he would start teaching the workers about hardware and software engineering. And while they earn, of course he expected them to make these calculators as well. In this way, they would definitely gain knowledge and experience about computing systems. And coupled with the fact that the photocopying machine would still have computer systems as well, it was very clear that the men would have as much practice as needed within this time frame. Bottom line, Landon was hell-bent on introducing computer-operated gadgets within Baymart. For now, Landon wanted to make small tools and gadgets that ran fewer computations. Of course, things like mobile phones, video games, actual computers, and laptops wouldn't come up until two or three years later, since they were more complicated and performed too many functions at once. But things like walkie-talkies and calculators, or even landlines, just did basic operations that weren't hard for the workers to currently make. So those were good. One had to know that there were several computer systems that existed, and Landon was going to take computer development step by step. So in essence, only systems that could be made presently were those that did one-mode operated functions. Anyone could put a calculator together, provided that they knew all the parts. Hardware engineering was totally different from computer engineering. For programming and multiple computational functions, those would have to take several more years to be done. But those ones that did over hundreds of applications would have to wait for later. Like Landon had said, why should he wait for hundreds of years just to get things done? Unlike those on in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or even 90s. He knew everything, PR rather he had access to everything. So why should he wait? If someone sat another person down, and aided them in building all the calculator parts from scratch and putting them together, will it really be hard for them to grasp the concept of hardware engineering? Please. Back on Earth, there were 11-year-old children that could build their own calculators from scratch, YouTube, given that all the parts were made for them. Landon was giving them four months, December to March, just to build this calculator and learn about the basics of hardware and software engineering. How is that not enough? Within this time frame, he expected them to make several trials and errors, so as to get the perfect calculator. Plus, 
It wasn't like Landon was overcrowding the workers' brains. Some workers were only focusing on electrical engineering, while others focused on chemistry, and so on. This time, he was determined to make software and hardware engineers from some of the men. Landon didn't care about the development speed at all. Was it his fault that he knew or had access to everything at once? If those on Earth knew how to teleport or fly, do you think that they would wait for anyone else? He knew everything, so why couldn't he create what he wanted as he deemed fit? His world, his business, his soul. He had to hurriedly pass Earth's standards so that he could start researching another world's technology. He might as well do all he could ASAP. One could never know. He might just die in a year or two. Of course, if he truly died by then, Landon was sure that he would have probably failed his mission. And by that time, his soul will definitely be shred into pieces. All in all, Baymard was going to breathe after these tools were made and only focus on construction up till April. That was four months. Within this time, he would teach them hardware and software engineering. And sometime next year or the year after that, he would start teaching them computer engineering for programming. So just to be clear, Landon wasn't making a laptop computers or cell phones. He was just making a calculator, which was basically the simplest form of a computerized operations. What he wanted to do was to introduce these concepts now so that the workers could use the next two or three years to focus in hardware and software engineering before advancing to computer engineering years later. As for radios, they used wave frequency to operate. So within these years, he will teach the men physics. Anyone could literally make a radio from a coin, spoon, battery, and wires. Some people who got stranded on the forest could moor them from all the metal that they had. And even some children on YouTube channels back on Earth could make them from scratch. Landon was willing to use this entire winter period to focus on them. Riverdale City, Arcadena. In a large hall, several men had gathered around 86 other men. These 86 men knelt on the floor while everyone else surrounded them within the hall. And standing directly in front of them were four other men. Speak. What happened to my father? Martyr Shannon and the three night captains had finally arrived at Riverdale City with their men two days ago. Well, speak. What happened? The men on the floor shivered as they struggled to explain their story frantically. Young master, Lord Shannon had gotten a letter from the capital. We didn't know what the letter had said. But after a few days, the Lord had gathered us all to head out towards the capital. And, and once we had passed Omar City, we were ambushed at the Valley Road by 15,000 mercenaries. Martyr and the night captains were shocked. Who had Shannon offended? 15,000 mercenaries were really a lot. Omar City? Isn't that three cities away from here? One of the night captains asked. One should know that their mission here was to locate Shannon's whereabouts. And once they did, then they had to find a way to kill him. Or report back to the king, if killing him was too hard for them to do. Shannon was indeed a tough nut to crack, as he was usually one stop ahead of his enemies. They had come prepared with thousands of men, just to take him down. But now, they had just heard that he was dead? Could it really be true? Or was this all part of his scheme to make them drop their guard? And if he did die, who was the one who had done them such a great service? So many questions kept popping within their minds as they looked at the men kneeling before them. But no matter what, they had to make sure that these soldiers kneeling on the floor were indeed telling the truth. Yes, my lords, we were attacked three cities away from here. We, we struggled to save the Lord, but the enemy was too strong and we were already outnumbered. Martyr was fuming as he listened to their story. Who on earth could have done this? No matter how he looked at it, Baron Kane and Alec Barn were the only ones who could have done this. Deep within his heart, he knew that his father was already dead. Hump, it seems like that wild father of yours went around looking for trouble here and there. One of the captains said, serves him right. He acted as if he was more important than the king himself. This is the ancestor's punishment onto him. Another captain said, we will stay here for three months to fully investigate everything. And at the end of our stay, you will receive his majesty's verdict. You will become the next city lord of this run-down city. But that's only if your father is truly dead. All right, we'll leave you to sort out this mess. Martyr balled his fists as he stared at the three captains, who were just leaving the room. How dare they talk about his father like that? 
bastards. Martyr looked at the men on the floor and his eyes turned cold. So you're all telling me that when my father needed you most, you turned around and fled? Under my father's rule, what is the punishment for not saving your master? The men on the floor shivered with fear, and their faces turned pale. No, no, young master. We, we tried our best to save him. We only came back after he died. All the men started begging Martyr for mercy. Martyr looked at his own personal men standing around him and issued out his command. Kill them all by hanging. As for their families, kill everyone above the age of 20. And for those below that age group, sell the boys to any slave traders. As for the girls, lock them up within the dungeon. It's been a long time since I've tasted the pleasure of a woman. All those soldiers who were kneeling began crying almost immediately. If they had known that this would happen, then they would have just allowed themselves to be killed on the battlefield instead. At least those who had died previously still had their families safe and sound, while they on the other hand had to have their whole lineage destroyed. W.H. about their innocent wives. What about their children? No, please, young master, please. My daughter is just five years old. Please spare her. Martyr stood there silently as he watched these men beg and wail out loud. Now they cared about their families? Where were they when his own family was destroyed? He had lost his brothers and his father. But had anyone ever shown him compassion? He had wanted to be king, so he had tried his best to woo Jeanette Barn. But did that be asterisk asterisk sage ever agree to his request? Instead, she was busy falling in love with Anthony Martinez. And now, they were probably happily married while he was still struggling to get more power. Lock them up and capture their families. Make sure that no one escapes. Jungo Border City, Arcadena. Eli and his group had arrived at the border five days ago and made camp around the outskirts of the city. They had laid out their plans cleanly and were currently undergoing their first battle. Currently, there were four city lords with Eli, and each lord had brought 5,000 men with them. Although Eli officially had 10,000 men under him as the first prince, he had decided to only bring half of the amount for this battle. Of course, the rest were currently staying at his other bases around Arcadena. Anyway, in total, Eli and his group had come to Jungo City with 25,000 men. In battles like these ones, it was good to send the men out in batches. Hence, Eli had began by sending 5,000 men to the battlefields. From there on, they would continue sending back up in batches of 1,000s to aid those on the fields. How is the battle proceeding? Your Highness, the men are holding up just fine. At daybreak, we'll send out the next group to attack the city. One of the city lords answered. Eli looked at the old map in front of him and pointed at a certain location. I think we should hit this point next. Judging by the defense tactics that they had displayed these past few days, it's obvious that they have been neglecting this area. The city lords looked at the map and nodded. I agree with you, your highness. We have been attacking the northern gates ever since we got here. So it's safe for them to think that we will continue with that same approach. This will lead us with a chance to create a diversion. Exactly. From what the scouts and spies have said, most of the enemy's knights have been too focused on that northern gate. So other areas currently have fewer knights guarding them. First thing tomorrow morning, send 1,500 knights towards the other gates. We will attack all sides at once. Eli said, this would surely cause a huge wave of confusion and disorderliness within the border city. All right, let's wrap up this meeting for now. You're all dismissed. Everyone gave a slight bow and exited the tent. It was time for Eli to sleep. He got up and walked further into the tent. He walked towards his bedroom chambers. The tent was large and massive, like one of those large ancient Egyptian tents seen in movies. As the general, he wouldn't necessarily go to the battlefields. He was just supposed to strategize for the battle, as well as have his men command and fight these battles in his place. His job was to make sure that everything went on according to plan. He operated like the CEO of a company while the knights worked under him to ensure that the company makes money. His presence on the battlefield was only needed if the army was in dire need of help, encouragement, or moral support. Sometimes, his presence and his speeches would make the men feel energized and strong. Ever since he got here, he had been sleeping for four hours a day only. This was a battlefield, and things changed quickly. Hence, as the general, 
His time and attention was always needed. Two hours into Eli's sleep, two hooded men jumped down from the trees and landed beside his tent. It was currently 3 a.m. The men stealthily approached Eli's tent. They had to be quiet because while some of Eli's men were fast asleep, a majority of the knights were still wide awake, since the war was still going on at the battlefield. With all this in mind, the assassins had purposely left their swords behind and had only brought only their daggers with them. Killing Eli in his tent was the only way for them to complete their mission, since they weren't sure whether or not their prey would ever step onto the battlefield. The assassins, on the other hand, had been observing Eli for a while now. They noticed that this general here didn't like people guarding his tent, so the tent was always left unguarded. Eli had told his men that all the knights were needed on the battlefield. He had told them that it would be a waste for them to spend their nights guarding him. Hence, there were no guards around his tent. The assassins moved like the wind as they made their way towards Eli's tent. And just when they were about to enter the tent, they froze instantly. They could feel the immense killing intent directed at them. Whoop! Whoop! Two other men had come out from the bushes. How could Eli not be prepared for these assassins? The real reason why Eli had insisted on having no guards around his tent was because he felt like he didn't need them, since he already had skilled hidden guards around him. Before coming here, he had paid 18 of the top assassins within Arcadena to be his bodyguards within this time frame. The reason why these enemy assassins didn't notice them was because they had always remained in hiding all through his stay here. When these assassins came earlier to spy on Eli, these bodyguards hadn't moved from their hiding spots and had always blended in with nature. They weren't supposed to communicate with Eli at all unless there was an emergency. And if they really had to talk to him, they would have to wear a knight's uniform in order to do so. Out of these 18 bodyguards, Eli had nine constantly were currently watching over him, while the other half rested. Although they were nine people currently protecting Eli, only one had popped up. No matter what, they all felt like it would be insulting to their pride. If they all ganged up and killed those two assassins. Hence, only one bodyguard showed himself to these assassins. The bodyguard was much larger and taller than the assassins. This made him look like a giant to the assassins.